Hello, pause and read people. It's just Tyler today. Uh, I want to do a little bit of a review of a book I recently read. This isn't going to be like a video essay like the thing was. Um, more just a casual discussion about the book. And the book is We Have Always Lived in the Castle by Shirley Jackson. I wasn't really familiar with Jackson's work except the lottery, but everyone kind of reads that in high school. But I started reading more of her stuff. I read Haunting of Hill House and I've just ordered The Hangman, so I'm going to read that soon as well. This book, We Have Always Lived in the Castle, just kind of struck me as a very interesting read and I thought you guys would enjoy hearing about it as much as I enjoy reading it. The title is a little bit uh, misleading. It's, I mean, there's no castle in the book, but once you kind of discover what the book is about, the title makes a lot more sense. And the best way for you guys to kind of get the vibe of what this book is, is for me basically just to read the synopsis on the front cover. My name is Mary Catherine Blackwood. I'm 18 years old, and I live with my sister Constance. I have always thought that with any luck at all, I could have been born a werewolf, because the two middle fingers on both my hands are the same length. I dislike washing myself and dogs. I like my sister Constance and Richard Plantagenet, and the Amanita Theloides, the Death Cup Mushroom. Everyone else in my family is dead. You will be wondering about the sugar bowl, I imagine. Is it still in use? You are wondering, has it been cleaned? You may very well ask, was it thoroughly washed? Follow uh, Mary Catherine Blackwood, who is a young woman, and her and her sister Constance, along with their uh, very elderly and disabled uncle, live all alone uh, in this estate that their family has left them following all of their premature deaths, which, uh, as you from the synopsis, is easy to tell, happens at the hand of Mary. She poisons her entire family for reasons that were not really clear and we never really learn uh, through the book. Basically, that she's just sort of a troubled child and she dislikes the world around her. And she uses her imagination as escapism. So, throughout the book, you'll see how she sees the world different than everyone else. All the people in the town, for instance, that is near their house, sees the Blackwoods as this reclusive small group of people that are sitting on this fortune in this, you know, uh, large manor on the outskirts of town. They don't let anyone on their property. They don't talk to anyone. They really only have uh, interactions when they go into the town to get food and supplies and stuff like that or when they have uh, one of their neighbors comes over and has tea with them every now and then to just, you know, catch up, see how they're doing, make sure the, these two young girls that are living there are still alive and well. Uh, the best way I can describe the feeling of this book is just like homey. It feels like, it feels like a fireplace or like a cool night where you're warm and cozy. You really get the sense that Mary is living in her own world. She is constantly putting uh, like wards up on their property, uh, practicing witchcraft. It's not really, uh, you never get the vibe that anything she's doing is actual witchcraft or has any magical powers, but she's doing these things to keep people away. Uh, she like buries things to keep them safe or she'll, she does this thing where she'll say, if Constance says like the word blueberry today, this will happen. She does all these predictions and kind of uh, mystic things as really sort of like a coping mechanism for her. You really get the sense that she didn't really understand what she was doing when she poisoned and killed her entire family. Uh, it was kind of like she was upset with them and she knew the mushroom was poisoned, but she doesn't really come to terms with that. She kind of lives in this false reality where everything is a little bit more whimsical and uh, mystical than the reality is and slowly throughout the book she starts to come to terms with that so Mary kind of lives in this fantasy world where she has a very uh, mundane routine her sister Constance is kind of has this like uh, agoraphobia slash PTSD she doesn't really go out uh, she has a very you know strict schedule along with their uncle who he's pretty much bedridden and he's a little uh, he has some sort of dementia or memory loss so it's difficult for them to get coherent conversations out of him. So basically they just spend their days caring for their uncle and living this very secluded routine life. And then you have their first bump in the road where 
uh, someone comes to live with them and it really upsets the cycle and especially upsets Mary. She feels like he is an invader. He doesn't belong with them. He comes in and tries to instill some sense of normalcy with the family. He starts, you know, making them go out a little bit more. He'll bring in food. He, he rearranges things, which Mary dislikes uh, very much because it's kind of like this mausoleum to what her family was before they all perished. He sleeps in their dad's bedroom. You do kind of get the sense that he's after uh, this fortune, which they may or may not have. That he's trying to uh, get money out of them. But that's never the main focus. That's just kind of like a thing in the back of your head that you might not want to trust this guy because his intentions may not be all that benevolent. And so this is the first thing that really upsets Mary. She kind of uses... Uh, cousin Charles is his name. She uses him as like a crux to show how evil the outside world is and how they just want things from them. And she starts doing things to disrupt him. She like messes with his stuff, destroys things, breaks things, talks trash about him to uh, their uncle and Constance. And she's just trying to do whatever she can to make him leave. And eventually this does uh, work to an extent, but the town becomes very troubled and they do things to mess with the house itself, their castle, their, you know, their rock, what they are able to cling on to. And the more their house gets destroyed, the more that their false reality starts to crumble away and they start to see the reality of their situation. Uh, at one point, they're just uh, living in a partially burned up house with rainwater coming in and they can only use like you know, a very small portion of the house and they're trying to live there without any disturbance. And that's when Constance and Mary start to have these real conversations about their situation. And Constance is more or less broken out of the spell, so to speak, that Mary has set. And she starts to see things as they really are, see how dire their current situation is. And then together as sisters, they start to process the loss of their family. But ultimately, you know, you would think uh, that they would decide to move on. We're going to move out of this house. We're going to move into town. We're going to become functional members of society. But where that kind of uh, Shirley Jackson twist or horror comes in is that they ultimately decide to further reinforce themselves or bunker themselves in to their, you know, partially destroyed home. And they choose to forever stay in this place and just completely cut themselves off from the outside world. And really that's what makes this such a tragedy and such a interesting and compelling story is that in the end they don't choose the better option. They don't choose to improve their lives. They choose to stay stuck in their ways even though they have seen the potential to move on to a better way of living. And that's just what made the book so interesting for me. You know, um, you would think with a more maybe a more modern telling of the story, uh, Constance might decide to get married or they might move out of the house once it's destroyed or, you know, fully break the illusion that Mary has set for them and they might see things as they really are and decide, uh, we'll just sell the land and go live in the suburbs somewhere. But no, they actually decide to stay in the house. They decide to live this fantasy that they've created for themselves and basically choose isolation over the uh the wider world and really if you have a chance i highly recommend picking this book up uh, it's a very short read it's like 150 pages and it just feels so nice to read kind of gives off the lemony snicket vibe if you've read series of unfortunate events everything is very like proper and in place and the way they speak to each other is very nice and you see why they are drawn into this fantasy it seems so much nicer than the outside world and so much more friendly and inviting and more like a place you would actually want to live instead of you know the more harsh realities of their situation of or of just regular everyday life and you begin to realize why they choose to live like this why would they would choose to live in delusion rather than face their own reality and as an extension of that you may begin to even question what is reality if they choose to live like this and it makes sense in their heads and every day they live out this fantasy of sort of being alone in this cottage or castle would be uh, more correct and they live in a world of magic where omens and witchery exists if it works for them is that reality in itself and is everyone else just uh living 
a different fantasy, one that seems more normal to them but doesn't really work for Constance and Mary. It's philosophies like that that make the book very interesting. Also, quick side note, it's got deckled edges, which I love. Are you a deckled edges person? I am. Big fan. Uh, it's just basically a textured edge where every page is a different length. And it kind of creates this cool effect on the page edge. I don't know if you can see it totally on camera, but uh, there it is. And that is We Have Always Lived in the Castle. I'm not going to do a spoiler review or go into too much detail because it is such a short book and it really is something you should experience on your own. Pick it up. You can read it in like a, a day or two. Like I said, it's really short. And it's nice to see a new perspective. Perhaps it opens your eyes a little bit and you can see how you can choose to live your own reality and perhaps the reality that is set up by the majority isn't the only option. And it's just a, a fun way of thinking that might uh, brighten your perspective a little bit. So uh, thank you guys for watching. I'm not going to upload this to the uh, podcast channels just because it's such a short review, but uh, I am going to upload snippets of this and lots of other content to our TikTok page. I'll link that below. So if you're interested in following Pause and Read, on TikTok, go ahead and do that. Uh, that's about it for this review. Thank you guys for watching. Pause and...